So I'm very happy to welcome you all to a very special edition of Codex uh, with uh, John Benedetto as a speaker. He is a professor of mathematics at the University of Maryland, and he earned his BA from Boston College in 1960, MA from Harvard in 1962, and PhD under Chandler Davis from the University of Toronto in 1964. He has led a long, illustrious career and is still actively working, currently advising five doctoral students, presuming his website is up to date. It would be hard to overstate the impact he's had on the field of harmonic analysis. He is the director and co-founder of the Norbert Wiener Center for Harmonic Analysis and Applications, the founding editor-in-chief of the journal of Fourier Analysis and Applications, and the series editor of the Applied and Harmonic, Numerical Harmonic Analysis book series from Burkhoiser. He has been prolific in his doctoral advising with 59 mathematical children, uh, including a number of Codex speakers. I myself uh, and number 40, Matt Fickus, number 24, Kaso Kuju, who also spoke earlier this semester, is a grandchild. Uh, upcoming speakers, Alex Kloninger and Chris Heil, will number 49 and number eight, respectively. And I assume that moving forward with the Codex seminar, we'll see many more off mathematical offspring of John Benedetto. He has published more than 180 Stop. research papers. <laughs> Sorry. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Got a few more sentences. You have to take this, the, the praise. Um, so he's published more than 180 research papers. And over the course of his career, he has received a number of accolades, including being named a senior Fulbright Hayes Scholar in 1973-74, SBIE Wavelet Pioneer in 2011, an AMS Fellow in 2015, and a SIAM Fellow in 2016. So we are very, very honored and privileged to have John Benedetto uh, speaking here in Codex on spectral super resolution and unique extensions for complex measures. Take it away. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, that was much too eloquent and the talk is going to be a let, let down now, but uh, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you folks started the seminar. I think it's a, a tremendous service to the community. So the title of my talk is Spectral Super Resolution and Unique Extensions for Complex Measures. This is joint work with Chen Zi Zhao and I'm uh, happy to give my appreciation to the ARO for their support of some of this work. Um, hold on. Uh, so I divided the talk into uh, four parts, and the first part is on uh, total variation minimization, <clears throat> and it's more or less getting our feet wet uh, into what I'm aiming for, which are these uh, unique extensions. So broadly speaking, super resolution is concerned with recovering fine details, high frequency, information from coarse information, low frequency. And it's an oversimplification, but there are two main categories of super resolution. Uh, one is uh, spectral extrapolation, and there are all sorts of applications in optics and radar and geophysics and astronomy and medical imaging, including MRI problems. And the other category the way I think of it is in terms of spatial interpolation, where things get very geometrical, and these arise in image processing, for example, in, in painting problems. So for this talk, we're focusing completely on uh, spectral extrapolation, and even a very special case of that. So in particular, we shall not deal with the critical setting of noisy environments, and also, we shall not deal with the highly motivated spatial setting of super resolution, where non-uniform sampling and multiple measurements play an essential role. This, this in fact, is quite exciting uh, because some of us really love non-uniform sampling. And the idea of uh, building a complete image from uh, snapshots is always very intriguing. But anyhow, we're doing spectral extrapolation. So standard notation, uh, TD is the D-dimensional torus group. M of TD 
is the space of complex regular Borel measures on TD. And I'll frequently also refer to them as complex Radon measures on TD. That norm will be always the total variation norm in this talk on the space of Radon measures. And uh, the Fourier transform of a Radon measure is a function defined on the dual group, so ZD, taking complex values, and it's defined as u hat of m is the integral over the torus of e to the minus two pi i m dot x d mu of x. And the key bullet here really is that we're gonna be looking at sets lambda contained in ZD, and we're gonna be thinking of them as spectral sampling sets. And I'll explain what that means. So uh, suppose unknown information is modeled as a bounded Radon measure. Uh, now that is really uh, naive in general, but let's suppose it's modeled that way. And assume that given low frequency information, is modeled as spectral data, and by, I'm going to call that f of n, where n is going to be in lambda. And by that I mean, when I say it's spectral data, I mean that I can find a bounded Radon measure, nu, a complex Radon measure, nu, such that the, its Fourier transform is equal to f on lambda. Well, the problem is to recover mu. We, we uh, don't have that mu. So, with the goal of recovering mu from that uh, given data f, we pose, along with many, many other people, the total variation minimization problem. Namely, we're looking for the infimum of all those norms of nu, subject to nu being a complex Radon measure and nu hat being equal to f on nu. And, uh, Caveat emptor, uh, first bullet, solutions to this problem are not always possible to find even theoretically. And the more, more important of these bullets is when they are possible to find, the, the mathematical modeling in terms of the norm is generally not a fine enough criterion for most physical problems ones we're interested in, for example, in image processing. And it is here that the vast array of often custom-made spectral estimation techniques from years past may resurrect and reinvent themselves in this context. Certainly in the middle part of last century and well into the 80s, uh, spectral estimation was a very important topic. And I'll say a few things at the end about it, but there are all these techniques, which are, as I say, custom made sometimes, which have to, in some sense, interleave with theoretical solutions like the TV problem. Okay, to focus a little bit, um, our TV problem is based on the theory of Candes and Fernandez Granda for finitely supported complex Radon measures. And they got very involved with, I'd say, seminal papers on uh, this whole business of spectral extrapolation, spectral super resolution, uh, and made significant progress uh, really calibrating the distances between the support points. Now, when we got involved in this uh, with Waylon Lee, uh, and we were dealing with finite sets, and this is a very exciting area still and completely uh, not resolved completely, rather. Our main idea for finite sets was uh, inspired by the classical work of Berling. Uh, and Berling's uh, work is very deep and uh, we exploited some of his results. For today's lecture, I'm not gonna talk about finite sets. In fact, they're gonna be infinite Hopefully I can persuade you they're sparse and they're called model sets. Uh, 
Problem TV is a convex minimization problem, and we interpret a solution as a simple or least complicated high resolution extrapolation of F. Okay. Let me just introduce uh, a notation here. Uh, let epsilon be the smallest value attained by problem TV. That is, uh, epsilon, which will depend on uh, lambda and f, is the infimum of all those total variation norms where nu hat is equal to f on lambda. And let E be the set of all solutions to problem TV. That is to say, E, which depends on lambda and f, is the set of all complex dry down measures where the norm is equal to epsilon and those measures nu hat are equal to f on lambda. And if there, a, a nu is in E, then we say that nu is a minimal extrapolation from lambda. It's not obvious, but uh, you have to say it. Uh, e is not the empty set. Uh, and that's a Banach uh, al aglu weak star compactness argument. So it's a very important fact, it's true, but it's highly non constructive. So, more or less useless once we know it's true. And we're still talking about TV minimization. And what we're interested here and why we're really focusing on it is uniqueness. So why are unique solutions important? Well, if mu in E lambda f is unique, then that's a theoretical thing. We're just doing a, a, a sort of an abstract infimum problem here. But, but once you know it's unique, then any algorithm or any numerical solution to TV approximates mu. So that's a really good thing to have uniqueness. Without uniqueness, even if mu, the desired unknown, is in this set E, it's possible that a numerical solution, your best algorithm to problem TV, does not approximate mu. So it becomes very important if you're going to do serious, effective spectral super resolution to know what the uniqueness situation is. OK, now I'm going to um, go to the second, second topic. And the title of this topic is the prescient Eve Mayer. Now, uh, I'm not uh, sucking up to Eve here, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, he did some, well, his whole career has been remarkable, but in the very early 70s, he had some ideas which really were prescient. And so the first issue on this part of the talk on the prescient Eve Mayer is Kronika's theorem. So this involves uniform approximation by characters. So I'm going to let G be a locally compact abelian group. And lambda, lambda is always going to be the spectral sampling set. Lambda is going to be in the dual group, G hat. Now, most of this talk is going to have uh, G being the torus or the d-dimensional torus, and lambda will be a subset of ZD or integers. But uh, for stating sort of these general definitions, uh, it seemed to me that it's cleaner somehow to state it in this generality. But if you want, you just can think of uh, G being the torus and lambda and, and G hat being the integers. Well, we're going to say that lambda is independent if for every lambda 1 up to lambda n in cap lambda, and for every n integers p1 up to pn, then either each summoned pj lambda j is 0 
or the sum from j equals one to n of pj lambda j is not zero. So this is a, an independence criterion. Hi, John, real, real quick. Um, so obviously we're dealing with abelian groups who can think of things being additive, but then once you're in the character group, I like to think of these being multiplicative. So yeah, that's, the way lambdas, I think. that's the way I Okay, think. so it really is like you have the function from G to the torus and you're taking the linear combination of the functions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And I'm looking at right. that torus as the circle group, so that's multiplicative. Right, okay. all right, thank you. Uh, okay, so now, we're going to say that a closed set lambda in G hat is a Kronecker set if it has this uniform approximation property. For every epsilon greater than zero and for every function phi from lambda into uh, T, and just to emphasize what uh, Emily just said, uh, lambda is a subset of uh, G hat we're going to think of as an additive operation of the group, but in the torus, I'm thinking of the circle where I'm multiplying. But so for every epsilon greater than zero, for every phi, where phi is continuous on lambda, and I'm just repeating myself here by saying the absolute value of phi is equal to one on lambda, we can find an element of the dual group G, which will of course depend on phi and epsilon, such that the supremum of all the gammas in cap lambda, or phi of gamma minus y of gamma is less than epsilon. So I'm uniformly approximating phi on lambda by one uh, character. Okay, so in 1884, Kronecker, after not being very kind to Cantor from, uh, did an outstanding, he did a, many outstanding things mathematically, but he proved the following result, but not in this uh, statement, not, not uh, in these words. He proved that every finite independent set lambda contained in R hat is a Kronecker set. And uh, conversely, uh, all Kronecker sets are independent. Well, this became a very important result, especially in the early part of the 20th century. And there were uh, many proofs, four or five at least, which are essentially different and due to some real luminaries like Niels Bohr and Hermann Weyl, and they had applications in mind. I particularly like, I'm only mentioning it because I'm not gonna do it, but I particularly like uh, uh, a proof where we can use a Heinbonic theorem for locally compact abelian groups and the Bohr compactification comes up here, but that's, that's just a throwaway remark. So that's Kronecker's theorem. And now I'm going to talk about harmonious sets. And this is a notion due to Eve. Mayer introduced the notion of a harmonious set in 1970 in a uh, publication, uh, a Springer publication, and then in a book he wrote in 1972. And so let lambda be contained in G hat. And then look at the group generated by lambda and put the discrete topology on it. A non-discrete character is the restriction x lambda to lambda of some algebraic homomorphism from the group lambda sub d into the torus. So we're in the same milieu as we were with Kronika. And Meyer defined harmonious set in the following way. He said, lambda is a harmonious set if every lambda discrete character, x of lambda, can be uniformly approximated on lambda by some uh, element of the, character of the dual group. So what that says is the following. For every epsilon greater than zero, and for every one of these lambda discrete characters, x of lambda, we can find an element in the dual group in G, such the supremum over all gammas in lambda of x sub lambda at gamma minus y of gamma is less than epsilon. We're uniformly approximating that lambda discrete character on the set 
capital lambda by one character. And I introduced Kronika's theorem because it seemed like a nice historical uh, stepping stone to Maya's definition, but we also needed to prove that finite sets lambda in G hat are harmonious. So, uh, so harmonious sets are not a vacuous notion. And just to fix ideas a little bit, instead of general locally compact abelian groups, although we could do it for that, let G be metrizable so it has a translation variant metric and separable. If you do that, then G hat is the same properties. And Meyer proved the following theorem. If lambda containing in, contained in G hat is harmonious, so it has this uniform uh, approximation property, that implies that lambda is uniformly discrete. It's a uniformly discrete sequence. That is to say, there exists r greater than zero, such that for all lambda m and lambda n in cap lambda, the distance between them is bigger than or equal to r. So that's, that's remarkable to me. And it's non-trivial to prove too, but it's, a, it's remarkable to me because there's this uh, harmonicity or chronica type property. And out of it, you're going to be dealing with uniformly discrete sequences. And so I want to juxtapose that property about uniform discreteness by pointing out that if G is not compact, then uh, there are uncountable compact chronica sets lambda in G hat. So that is not obvious, but that is true. And besides the fact we're very much interested in harmonious sets in this talk, uh, we are also going to be using Kronika's theorem in several places uh, in, in our results. Okay, why the reason I use the word prescient is uh, contained in this slide. <clears throat> Mayer's theory of harmonious sets came about in 1970 and 1972. Schechtman has the theory of quasicrystals, which were already in the, in the brains of chemists and physicists. And uh, those two theories, you know, and Mayer's theory definitely uh, preceded Schechtman's work, uh, uh, have been analyzed and compared, and they are really and truly similar. I, I've got an extensive list of uh, uh, bibliography here where many people have talked about this if you're not aware of it, uh, but it's, it's fascinating. And uh, in the midst of all this are Penrose tilings too. These, these guys are all sort of related. Well, one of the great mathematical crystallographers was Delone. In his early years, he was uh, Delaunay. Uh, uh, he, uh, he defined, we say a set is a Delone set. So lambda contained in G hat is a Delone set if it is uniformly discrete and it has this quasi density property. Namely, there exists a compact set C such that G hat is equal to lambda plus C. Uh, and now a fundamental notion here is that of a Mayer set. So I mentioned that Mayer defined harmonious sets and we're gonna say along with Mooney that the lambda is a Mayer set if it is harmonious and alone. So I don't wanna get too high tech here, but when you're thinking harmon, think of, excuse me, when you're thinking harmonious, we're thinking of uh, uh, th this sort of uniform approximation property. And alone, we're gonna be having uniform discrete. And uh, we want this uh, type of uh, density. And why did he, Mayer introduce harmonious sets. He was not coming from chemistry or physics. He introduced them because he was very much interested in Pisot numbers 
and Salem numbers. And he was very much interested in uh, the fact that there are very important uh, groups that do not have discrete subgroups. And discrete subgroups allow for discretizations for applications. I mean, basically, if you have a distribution or something complicated, you might want to have simpler things which can approximate it. And if you've got a, 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 a a group like our N that is uh, got discrete subgroups, then this gives you a way of doing approximations. We do it all the time in lots of types of analysis. But Mayer was interested. He he has this uh, new number theory funny bone, and he was very much interested in uh, uh, dealing with fields like QP, and uh, they, they have no discrete subgroup. So uh, this is a, somehow the mathematical background for what he did. And Sorry, John, may I, may I interrupt again? Um, so given this example of the piatics, um, is it the case that, say, if you take some set of coset representatives of the piatic integers and the piatics, that that ends up being a Mayer set? Oh, I never checked. I'm not sure. Okay, because clearly it's uniformly discrete, and the shifts with that and the and the piatic integers gives you kind of. That, that, that's definitely worth checking. I just haven't done it. I just haven't done it. All so. right, thank you. I bet that's very doable, though. So, uh, anyhow, by the nature of quasi crystals and Mayer sets, one can deal with. I mean, it gives you tremendous flexibility with aperiodic tilings without translational symmetries, as well as icosahedral and dodecahedral uh, quasi crystal geometric objects, and they appear physically in nature. I'm not sure if any of us will ever travel again, but uh, I, I first became aware of this at the Museum of Natural History in DC. And you see all these fantastic crystals that come from nature. And uh, basically, uh, Schechtman understood these things very, very well. And he got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011. Uh, Mayer and got the Gauss and Abel prizes. And a lot of people have worked in this area. I mean, it was initiated, the mathematical part of it, completely by, by Mayer with uh, Bombieri, Kuntakis, Ligarius, Mayer, of course, Moody, Seneschel, and I'm missing many other contributors, but it's a, it's a big area. Okay, now, combined with this idea of harmoniousness, which is uniform approximation, is another idea that uh, Mayer brought to the table. So we're going to say that a subgroup, uh, a gamma, of a locally compact abelian group X is a lattice. We all know what a lattice is, so think of R and R hat, or R. But is a lattice if it's a discrete set and if the quotient group X mod gamma is compact. And so now, let G and H be locally compact abelian groups. <clears throat> and let X be the direct product of G hat with H hat. A cut project scheme is a triple, G hat, H hat, uh, gamma, where the projections, we're looking at the natural projections. This looks very busy, but uh, uh, it, let's, let's see if we can make it palatable throughout here. If the natural projections where you're looking at G hat, direct product H hat into G hat, and G hat, direct product H hat into H hat, if you restrict those natural projections to the lattice, which is contained in the, the direct products, then those projections are injective with dense images. And here you can see that if you're going to have examples that uh, Results like chronic as they are, are going to be very helpful. And in this setting, then, may introduced Mayer introduced the notion of a model set. So take a, a compact set that satisfies some conditions. I, it's accurate there, but the idea is take some compact set in a chat. Now, this model set, lambda of omega, that's going to be in G hat. And it's going to be defined as P1 of gamma, where gamma is in uh, gamma, cap gamma, 
Okay, that makes it be in G hat, right? But we're just going to look at those gammas for which P2 of gamma, which is in H hat, is an omega. And the interesting thing is, because again, it's not apparent, that when we play this game with projections and the like, model sets are Mayer sets. Now, model sets are just going to be in G hat, but it requires another object, H hat. Model sets are Mayer sets, and then without being technical, I, I could be, but it, it would take us too far afield at this point. Uh, Mayer sets are almost lattices. And I just want to point out there's a, uh, I'll give the precise reference at the end, but there's a, I'd say a brilliant new paper out uh, by these four authors whose names will appear later uh, for going in the direction of locally compact abelian groups more generally than I am. Remember, I'm going to be on the, on the Taurus very, very soon now. Uh, but uh, I, I think there'll be uh, remarkable results in the future more generally. Okay, now let's get to the Taurus. I'm still, uh, title of this section is still depression to mayor. So let the G be the D dimensional Taurus, let H be Z, okay? And now define a mapping K from ZD into T this way. We're looking at all the, the, the dual group of TD is ZD. So uh, we're looking at D tuples of integers and K of a D tuple is going to be a sum of this form, N1, Q1, up to ND, QD, mod one, where uh, Q1 up to QD are irrationals and we have this linear independence to begin the whole process. Okay, so you've uh, got a situation where we define a function on ZD and we also can take a K of that being in T. And so what is our, uh, and it turns out K is injective with dense range against by, again, by one of these Kronecker arguments. Now we're gonna define our lattice, gamma, is going to be the set of all d tuples of integers and then k of this. So d tuple of integers, that's in zd. And so gamma is contained in zd cross t. And it is a lattice. Okay. Now, let's go over to where, to t here. And we're going to think of t as the uh, uh, interval minus a half to a half. And so for any alpha less than a half, let's look at the interval minus alpha to alpha. And so we're going to look at a four tuple, namely zdt, which is, we started with g being td and h being z. So I'm looking at the dual groups here. The, lamp, the lattice gamma, which we defined here because of our definition of K, and this compact set, minus alpha alpha. Well, it turns out this is a very nice example of a cut project scheme, and this is what the model set looks like. Okay, let's put a picture up. Uh, I'm gonna take two irrational, I'm gonna be, let D be equal to two, and I'm gonna like, uh, take two irrational numbers, namely square root of two and square root of three. Anything works, but this is just a fixed ideas. And then this picture here in ZD is the model set. And I'm taking two cases, alpha equals 0.15 and alpha equals point three. So it has this almost lattice property. It certainly is sparse in the sense it's not nearly all of ZD. If you look at any little square here, five by five square, there are 25 elements of, uh, of uh, Z, Z2 in there, but there are only eight or nine elements of, uh, of, of the model set. 
And so these will be our sampling sets. We'll be given information about the Fourier transforms of measures on such sets, and we'll want to know when we can obtain uniqueness properties. This, in some sense, is a problem that goes back to the very origins of this subject of uh, uh, when people were worrying about positive definite functions and uh, Herzog's theorem and Bachner's theorem and unique extensions and the work of Karathiodori, et cetera. Okay, third part of the talk. We're going to talk about uniqueness. We'll tell about uh, some of uh, the results we have. And uh, so much of it is based on the uh, awesome work of uh, Mayer. So we all know the classical Poisson summation formula. We let t be bigger than zero. Then the sum of those deltas is a tempered uh, distribution. Intersection, and it's also a measure. It's not a bounded measure, but it's a measure. And the uh, basic property is the uncertainty principle here, in the sense that the spreading nt of the points of the, of the deltas on one group is, uh, goes into the spreading n over t when you take its Fourier transform, and you have this wonderful formula. Well, may I prove the Poisson summation formula for model sets in 1970. And this, he, said he has subsequent work and research on it. But I also want to mention that much more recently, uh, uh, Nierlev and uh, Olevsky and Matusiak have, have, have worked on, on the uh, Poisson summation formula for model sets. And I'm looking at my watch here and thinking that I'm not going to explain this formula, but this is a correct statement formally of uh, the uh, Mayer's Poisson summation formula. And you notice that he's summing not over all the uh, integers, but he's summing over his model set. And now the thing that will correspond to that model set here in the dual situation is looking at the dual lattice. Okay. <clears throat> so our first theorem is, uh, uniqueness theorem is the following. Uh, take a, a cut project scheme, and now we're gonna look at the two groups, R hat, R hat. And this lattice here, gamma, which you can form by these irrational matrices. So, let lambda omega for any omega be the model set considered as a spectral sampling set constructed from this four tuple. So here are our groups, r hat, which is r, r hat, which is r. This uh, lattice and any compact omega uh, contained in this r hat. And Using Mayer's Poisson summation formula, uh, a direct calculation gives the following result. Suppose that mu and nu are discrete complex Radon measures supported by Z. If mu hat is equal to nu hat on the model set, then mu is equal to nu. That's definitely a uniqueness theorem. And I, I think this might be good to point out a good place to point out that one of our goals in all of this was uh, to extend uniqueness results from positive measures to complex measures. And there, not to make a bad pun, but there the complexity does arise significantly. Uh, this is a generalization of that using the same technique and I'll I'll skip it uh, for now. In some sense, the uh, main point of this talk and the, the origin of how we got involved is this result here by Basarab Mate, which I think is just beautiful. And uh, his uh, result, I, I will go through this now. So given Mate uh, and Mayer 
there's a significant uh, number of works in this general area, but this result on positive on uniqueness is as far as I know, Mate's. So given the cut project scheme, and here are our uh, groups here, Z2, T, gamma, the one I defined with that function, K, and this interval here, minus alpha and alpha. And the corresponding model set will just be this. Since I'm in uh, uh, Z2, these will be the, all the elements in Z cross Z for which there exists an R so that I'm inside the cut, inside the omega alpha. Now, Mate chose the following setting. He let script N of T2 be the set of positive, discrete, radon measures on T2. So they're positive measures and they're discrete. But they're not only just discrete, they only have finite support. Now, this does not make his theorem easy. It's just that uh, it's the right setting for what he did. And his theorem is the following. Let nu be one of these measures. If you take any positive Radon measure on T2, and the Fourier transforms are equal on the model set, so that's the spectral sampling set, then mu is equal to nu. And remember, if we were going to do serious spectral super resolution, we really needed uniqueness. That's why we're bent on, on doing a, a worrying about uniqueness. Now, this remark just says uh, that Mate's proof works for TD as he undoubtedly knew. But uh, this is Mate's theorem, which I think is a beauty. Now, in order to talk about our contribution here, I, I want to um, talk about Chabotarev's theorem, and, uh, which is amazing to me. Uh, he proved it in 1926, and here it is. Let P be a prime number, and let omega be a primitive pth root of unity, and given the DFT matrix, so these omegas here are uh, e of the form e to the two pi i, et cetera. Uh, so we've got the DFT matrix. Now, if you take any subsets M and N of Z mod PZ with the same cardinality, so they're sort of generalizations of square matrices, then this implies that the determinant of that square matrix is non-zero, it's not singular. And this has had so many uses through the years, uh, but let me just say a couple of things about uh, its history and its recent history. So first of all, Chabotarev's results are much more general than the special case. And there's uh, a fantastic article to me anyhow, by Lenstra and Stevenhagen in the uh, Mathematical Intelligencer in 1996, which uh, exposited uh, his contribution, Chabotarev's contributions in this area. Independent proofs, at least at this level, are due to Dudené. That surprised me when I first saw that work. And Evans and Isaacs, Tao and Frankel. Now, Tao's work is rather celebrated because of its uh, connection with uh, compressed sensing. And in fact, independently, Tao and Barreau proved that Chabotarev's theorem is true if and only if the uncertainty principle inequality holds. That is to say, for every function from Z mod PZ into C, where F is not identically zero, the cardinality of the support of F plus the cardinality of the support of F hat is big, bigger than or equal to P plus one. And for those of you who know your compressed sensing, you see that this result uh, is in the background of 
some of the more significant mathematical aspects of compressed sensing. Now, our basic result, it's uh, very technical, but the, it, it does depend on uh, an idea that I want to mention that I formulated this term in terms of a lemma. And so we're gonna make a matrix, we're gonna call it D. And it's gonna be M by M, where M is not necessarily prime. In Chabotarov's case, it was prime. And the row parameters of D are going to be linearly independent rational irrationals over Q. And the column parameters of D are going to be arbitrary distinct integers. And the proof of our lemma also uses uh, Kronika. So let me show you the matrix. Let K1 up to Km minus 1 be distinct non-zero integers. And these are the ones up here are going along the columns. And that's what I said in the previous slide when I said the column parameters are arbitrary distinct integers. And now as I come down the rows with the gamma one, gamma two, gamma m minus one, then that is what I meant in the previous column the previous slide that the row parameters are linearly independent irrationals over Q. Well, in this setting, where you take, you start off with uh, M minus one distinct non-zero integers, then we can find pairs of integers, P1, Q1, up to PM minus one, QM minus one, N zero, zero, such that when we define these gamma i's in terms of our irrational numbers, such that each gamma i is in minus alpha and alpha, and for which this matrix is non-singular. So it's like Chabotarov in the sense, uh, it looks like Chabotarov, but it's obviously quite different and the proof is quite different. So with that, here is our basic uh, result on uh, uniqueness. So given the cut project scheme, and so I'm in Z2 T, gamma is defined before in the interval minus alpha alpha with corresponding model set, that's a spectral sampling set where we're taking values of the Fourier transforms of measures. So just repeating it the same one we used before. And then using the lemma, we can prove the following result. Let rho be a finitely supported complex Radon measure. If rho is equal to zero on the model set, then rho is equal to zero. So the key point of this is that we are not relegated to positive measures and one does have to work diligently in a different way than Mate did. And I was truly being an optimist, but I don't have time to go through the details of the proof. But uh, it turns out that we can extend our results so that the support of rho does not need to be finite. In fact, the previous theorem can be fine to read uh, let rho be a discrete complex right on measure. Suppose there are irrationals such that, the, such that the support does not contain any infinite coset of this subgroup in T2. And so then in that situation, if the Fourier coefficients of rho vanish, then rho is equal to zero. That's sort of a mouthful, the, the uh, cleanest version is the one I originally said. And it's a, a genuine uniqueness theorem. And, uh, and we uh, get it in the generality of complex right on measures. And we also uh, get it for some infinitely supported measures. And now the fourth and final part of uh, my talk, which will be much shorter than all the others, 
is called super resolution and exact reconstruction. So a deodorized, generic, and possibly difficult super resolution problem is to reconstruct an unknown complex radon measure from given spectral information on a sparse, sometimes finite set lambda. So our earlier caveat mTOR remark is the reality check. In fact, I'm repeating to some extent with different acronyms here. I mean, this is part and parcel of 20th century spectral estimation theory from the profound underlying harmonic analysis of people like Berling to the spectacular array of algorithms like the maximum entropy, music, esprit, and the like. And I believe that there is real business here in combining them uh, in the next step forward. And so a, a general exact reconstruction problem is the following. Suppose there is new, a bounded radar measure, a complex radar measure, for which the spectral information nu hat is known on a set lambda. When is it possible to reconstruct nu from the spectral data by, sol by solving TV? That is to say, we want to solve the TV problem I stated at the very beginning. So that's a general problem. It turns out when we go back to Matei's theorem, uh, the exact reconstruction problem that Matei's theorem addresses, we only stated what he did for uniqueness, but it's the following. Suppose there is a new in his space. He's a positive measures with finite support. So the omegas are non-negative. For which the spectral information is known on a sparse, although albeit infinite model set, like the one I showed you with the, all the dots. When is it possible to reconstruct new? We had uniqueness, but when is it possible to reconstruct new from the spectral data by means of solving TV? And this is what Mate did in that same paper, by the way. So we have the same situation that cut project scheme on Z2, T, gamma, minus alpha, alpha. And he proved the following reconstruction theorem. If you take this positive measure, then you can solve this. Now that's a theoretical solution when you're looking at arg mins of norms, but uh, it's, a re it's reconstruction in the sense that you start doing dirty work and coming up with algorithms and approximations. And this is a consequence of his uniqueness theorem. And once again, although he doesn't state it, uh, but he, he certainly knows it. It's true for TD. And the good news, this is, this is my last slide, but there's, the other good news is that uh, there are counterexamples. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, in, naturally, I, uh, Chen Zi and I would like to prove the reconstruction that Mate did but there are counterexamples. We cannot generally reconstruct finitely supported complex radon measures variationally as Mate did for his positive measures within points in the support. And we do not have uniqueness generally for non-finitely supported complex radon measures. I have it for the finite case and some infinitely supported ones. And as I said, there are counterexamples. And that's always a good thing, right? Because uh, therefore there are problems and techniques. Oops, oops, da -da. For example, and this is, I think, very exciting to me. For example, this opens the door to formulate subspaces of complex radar measures, especially for the important case of surface measures and image processing. And this of course leads to host off measures and host off mentioned. And that in turn gets us to Riemann sets of uniqueness and closed measure zero sets supporting measures with decaying Fourier transforms as Menshoff did in his early example uh, 
for, for getting, I mean, if you take the ordinary Cantor set and, and look at the Cantor measure, its Fourier transform does not decay to zero, but you can have sets of measure zero where uh, they do. And that's what Menchop did. But this whole business now arise in what, arises in what's called Salem sets. And if you study the work of Matilla and uh, looking at host of measures and dimension with regard to surface measures, uh, this opens up looking at subspaces of measures for which we can search for uniqueness and, and reconstruction. And then coming full circle, oh boy. And then coming full circle to what I began with, there is Veropolis' theorem from 1965. And his theorem says that if lambda is a compact perfect chronic cassette, so this is one of those uncountable chronic cassettes. The lambda is a set of strong spectral resolution. That is to say, if we take any distribution, I'm looking at the space here, supported by lambda with bounded Fourier transform, then it is a measure. And this comes back for those few people remaining in the world interested in spectral synthesis for addressing unresolved problems in spectral synthesis. And that's the end, but let me just point out this beautiful paper by Agora, Antezana, Cabrelli, and Mate that I was alluding to earlier. I've uh, got the papers of Candes and Fernandez Granda, the works of uh, Kulunzakis and Ligarius, all the work, not all of it, but some of the work of Mate and Meyer, uh, the work of Lev and Olevsky and Matusiak. And that's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. So you can unmute and clap, or if you want to just show your reaction with the uh, virtual hand clapping. <laughs>